All right, so my name is Stuart Symes. Uh, I'm at uh, Chandler High School right now. I've taught there for three years, and previous to that, I was at Rush Springs for four years. Um, my background, I'm from Yukon, Oklahoma. Uh, I was born and raised there. I, uh, my grandparents ran a 50-acre produce farm. We raised several different varieties of vegetables and things like that. That's kind of my background into all this. Um, we did show livestock, but not a whole lot. Um, so when I started teaching livestock, I was strong in livestock. I went to school for livestock judging. I, I did a lot of showing. My sister did a lot of showing. So I had some background in it, um, but I was not prepared for the amount of livestock that I had at Rush Springs. Um, and like the young, immature, not educated young teacher that I used to be, I drove that program all the way to the top and created a monster that I hated from the very beginning. Um, so when I left Rush Springs, I came to Chandler. Chandler didn't have a whole lot of livestock on feed, um, so I took off on the horticulture stuff. Um, I started off with the greenhouse, and I was trying to get more kids involved because Chandler's more of a low-income community. Um, trying to talk those kids into showing livestock is very, very hard, and the livestock that I do get them talked into didn't hit the mark when we were at county or anywhere else. So I got into the gardening deal and I got into the, floor, the horticulture deal and it just took off. Um, my first summer there, we have a large farm and I'll get into that here in a minute. And we started, we started growing produce and started gathering speed and gathering speed and gathering speed and then I started this program. Um, this is my produce peeps program. So what I do is I take young FFA members that can't afford livestock, can't afford SAE projects, they live in town, they can't do anything at home. It's like, okay, well, do you have a job? No. Do you have a dog? No. Okay, well, then let's find something for you. So I started the Produce Peeps, and it creates an SAE experience in vegetable production for those students at my school farm. Um, there's no money up front for the material. Uh, I pay for all the material out of pocket from the chapter, and then they will pay me from their earnings that they get from the produce. Let's back up a little bit because I missed a bunch. Um, so what this means is kids will sign up for the program in October, um, and that's kind of when we start these projects rolling and planning and, and start to figuring out what we need to do. Um, we set seed, they, they group into two groups of two, they pick their produce that they want to grow. Um, they can pick multiple produces, they can pick one produce, it's whatever they want to do. Um, and then we roll on from there. So we pick produce, then we have work days in the, in the spring to get things ready. Uh, those kids will grow that produce at the school farm, they are fully in charge of maintaining it, managing it, preparing it, picking it, and then we go on to selling it as a group. Um, I have them, I knew that this was gonna be a project that needed some set in stone rules because I was not gonna get my investment back if I didn't set that as a standard from the very beginning. So I had the kids and the parents sign contracts just like I would at my school farm if they were wanting to house livestock there. They have to manage that project just like those livestock projects just like this project. Um, so they're in charge of all the maintenance, all the preparation for that. And then what I did is I set it up as, for our school farm, and I don't know how it is for y'all school farms, but the chapter pays for water, and then the chapter pays for any material that we need out there. So I had to set a, a number that they needed to meet to be able to pe cover all those costs because it's so much more than what we're used to. So, uh, and I'll get into that here in a minute. Um, the student contracts to ensure students will meet the requirements and then go from there. So here's our school farm. Our school farm is six acres um, and the garden areas take up almost three acres of that school farm. Uh, this project, I, made, I tried to make it to where it had to be at the school farm because everybody can manage it all at one time. And a lot of the kids that signed up for the program, uh, they didn't have the ability to grow mass produce at home. That was the whole purpose of this project, was to earn an income. 
not feed your family. Um, now, at school, we create garden boxes and things for the kids to take home, and, and they can grow their own vegetables at home. But on a large-scale system, the, a lot of them didn't have that option. So that's why I started at the school farm. Uh, and if you can see, we had three separate areas. And if any, who has a school farm in, in the classroom? Okay, is it bigger than mine, six acres? Or is it smaller? About the same size. So for me, uh, I'm in charge of managing and maintaining the school farm throughout the summer. And that first year I was at Chandler, mowing six acres like this almost two times a week got to be very time consuming. Um, and what better way to get rid of grass than to turn it over and make produce. So it made it easier on me, one, and it also gave the kids an opportunity to succeed in an SAE project. Um, we grow six, 10 different types of vegetables. Well, I divided those kids into groups of two, so we had 20 kids all together, and they were in charge of uh, setting up all their own things and getting things ready. Do you do a fall, like a winter crop? I have in the past, but with school starting and with all those other things going on with livestock, I just, it's too much. It's way too much. Um, summertime is super easy because, um, and that's another reason why I divided them into groups of two, because there's a 50% chance that one of them's gonna be gone, but the other one's gonna be there to help. Um, and that's kind of where I started there. Uh, schedule wise, and I didn't put that in here and now I'm mentioning it, I need to talk about it. Um, October, we start buying seed um, and we start gathering supplies. So I did some different types of growing methods this year and uh, started getting all that stuff gathered in October, which I'm so glad I did because I had some, I needed more in February and it was almost impossible to get it. Uh, almost impossible. And luckily I had people that do this very same thing as a business in my community that were able to help supplement some of that need. Um, so October we start gathering materials. October or December we start getting ready for planting. Now we started a little later this year than I wanted to because of my own greenhouse and the flowers in my own greenhouse um, and the size restraints of my greenhouse. So by February, July, January, you need to start planting seed, getting things ready to grow so that you can start getting it bigger. Um, and those kids that were part of this program, they were strictly in charge of growing the vegetables that we grew. Now, when it came to spring, that's when we started getting things ready. Um, March, we started tilling and plowing up land. I had one of the parents that was part of the kid that got into it. Uh, his dad had all that equipment and we were able to bring it all out there and get everything ready to go. Um, and then March we started spreading fertilizer, getting things ready. And then we started planting everything the end of April. And now we're into June and we're getting ready to start harvesting all of our produce this, this June. So SAEs that I focused on with this project were vegetable production and specialty crop production. Um, with the different styles of vegetables that we grew, we can fall into that specialty crop. Um, there's not a whole lot. There's, it's kind of a gray area on the specialty crop, but as long as you can make it specific or different than a regular vegetable, you can fit inside that specialty. And that's what we did. We had some uh, Indian corn. We have gourds. Um, pumpkins are going in next week. And then we'll have some different type of specialty vegetables that not everybody has like uh, Asian cucumbers and, and things like that, that offer a different type of vegetable. It opens up for that specialty crop. Um, grant programs, um, I have done two of these and with this program, I was able to get all the equipment over the last three years that I needed to perform this project. Uh, the Devon Energy Grant, we've done every year. Excuse me. Uh, that's where we got the seed germinator and the plastic roller. 
Um, if you've ever gardened, who, who, has, who has a garden at home that gardens on a regular basis? 90% uh, of your work is picking weeds. And with me being so busy over the summer and kids being so busy over the summer, that little piece of equipment right there saves you so much time. Um, but those are things that I got through my grant program. And then the SAE grants is what we're going to hit next year with those same kids um, to open up new avenues for them to be able to do it continuously. Um, and that's kind of where that's going. This year we missed the mark on the SAEs, and that's why I opened up as the chapter would cover the costs, and then you guys would pay me back for what I have in it. Um, but further on, we're going to do SAE grants where the kids actually own all the materials that go into what's going on instead of me. And then our area, if you're in the Stillwater area, it's, it's like a 100-mile radius around Stillwater or a 50-mile radius around Stillwater. Um, you are open to the Central Rural Electric Co-op co Grant. And what they do is they give you, there's $500,000 that they have set aside every year from collected off the top of their electrical bills. And they, you can write up to a $10,000 grant with them per year. And I paid for a lot of stuff with my, my greenhouse and my shop and everything like that through that grant program. Um, that's kind of where that went. No, I have a question on your yeah. plastic roller thing. What, what's the reel at the top? The reel, okay. So what this does is this is a subsurface irrigation system. Um, this is a plow, the plow that, that pulls in the soil from underneath. And then this piece of equipment will lay a drip irrigation line inside the furrow. And then it will cover it with plastic. Um, so what you're creating is about a four to six inch bed. And with my soils that I have at my school farm, I've learned from the past few years is that I'm really good soil or I'm really bad soil and I dry out really quickly because of the high sand content so I had to create this and this kind of creates a a greenhouse effect inside that plastic uh, it doesn't evaporate the soil uh, the moisture and it creates a deeper bed for root systems to grow um, my hard pan is about eight inches down so if I have anything with a tap root of any sort, I can't, it won't grow. It just won't pat, poke through that, that hard pan. So I created this and not created it, but I bought this and it helps with a lot of that, that issue. So this is kind of what we look like right now. Um, we are growing in this picture, we've got squash and then we, Mix with that, we also, I'm also trying to find new and exciting ways to do agri-science fair projects with all of this um, program. So I've got uh, grass seed, different types of grass seed growing in there, and some of it looks like weeds because the kids aren't proactive about pulling them all the time. But I've got different type of grass seeds in there that are growing to, as a cover crop, a summer cover crop um, to prevent erosion. All this system is on kind of a slope and without that, I would lose a lot of my topsoil. So we've kind of been testing different types of grasses that grow inside there. Um, over here is the drip irrigation system. Um, in the past, we've used overhead watering to water. We started out with watermelons is what we started out with. Um, and if any of you know about Rush Springs, that's kind of where that whole thing came into play. Um, so we started out with watermelons. Grew really well the first year, but not enough water. Grew really well the second year, but we had raccoons. So just kind of one of those play it by ear things. But this year I decided to get rid of the overhead water system. Um, those type of vegetables, most vegetables can't handle the overhead water. So, and it's easier on the kids. Um, obviously everyone knows summertime is busy for not only us, but for them. Um, and if they, all they have to do is go turn their rows on, turn the other rows off and turn the water on, they can go water their own crop and not have a problem. Um, I made it more user friendly and made it to where they can do it on their own instead of moving sprinklers every two hours. So that was the thing about this. And then uh, the plastic was, 
again, just a weed barrier helps start those plants earlier, helps get those plants a better, better contact to the soil. What do you anticipate your lifespan for like the drip irrigation? Okay, so like that's a good question. There's many different lifespans for this drip irrigation. You can buy, it just depends on how much you want to spend. Um, I bought the one season, excuse me, the one season drip irrigation and plastic. Now it's not biodegradable. You have to pick it all back up when it's done. Right. Mm, excuse me. But it's, uh, it's well worth it to, get it, to, go, to go forward with it. Um, especially if you're doing a uh, large scale operation, like not, this isn't, I wouldn't consider this large scale, but if you're doing this size of an operation, it's, it's well worth it. And all this, we'll have to pick all this up in the fall, which is probably gonna suck, but uh, it's, it's the easiest way to do all this now. And if you look at commercial vegetable production as of right now, that's what this is for. They do this. There's none of that. My grandfather, he was stuck in his old ways and he used a chisel plow. He used, uh, he used a harrow to get all the weeds out. He was out there at 6 a.m. with a hoe every morning. He's 86 years old and he's out there with a hoe, hoeing, and he had a bigger plate, bigger than this. Um, this is the industry. This is where industry is right now um, because it's just the simplicity of it the labor of it is so much less than anything else. Revenues and expenses, um, like I covered before, they, they kind of, there's no upfront cost for the kids. Um, but my uh, expenses was about 2,500 when it was all said and done. Now you could go more than that, but I didn't buy the water wheel transplanter that I thought I was going to get. So, I went with just the planting it by hand method and I put in $2,500. Uh, I would say about $500 of that was actual seed and materials, um, as in materials like uh, trays, soil to get plants started, um, and then the seed itself. Uh, and then the actual expensive part of it was. Uh, the main line, plastic main lines, the plastic, the lay plastic that we laid on top, and then the drip irrigation underneath, and then all the fittings that go along with that. Um, it was kind of, kind of a lot. Um, but I think if the kids, and the, we're, we're going to see a profit this year, um, a lot of our stuff is germinated. It really took off. The kids have done a great job with it, and they're really going to probably see a good profit. Um, it's, it's hard to tell right now, but with the way the world's working and the way that um, grocery stores are jacking up prices on produce and, and fresh vegetables, the uh, farmer's markets are where it's at right now. And that's how we'll market all of this. Now, this is the first year that we've attempted to do this, this size of the project. Um, in past years, it's been one field. If like go back to that other side. In past years, it was this right here. That was one, the one part we did. It was just watermelons and we marketed it as a, as a chapter, not as an individual. Um, the kids learned, the kids, the kids that helped me with the project, they got the SAE experience out of it. Um, it was more of a school-based uh, placement project is what it was, um, but I thought if we can open it up as an actual entrepreneurship, I think it'll be a lot better for them. And that's why we expanded to this side and that front side. Um, so with that, the kids, after they pay back their, their divided amount of money that, that would be the material cost, um, they keep 90% of all the profits and I'll take the 10% to cover uh, water costs and any other expenses like fertilizer that we would need throughout the, the summer. Um, the main focus for this was to be kids harvest the crops. We all go to the farmer's market on Saturday morning and just hit farmer's markets on Saturdays and, and sell our produce. Um, but I'm starting to realize that with the traction that we're gathering 
and the amount of publicity that the kids have put out there in the community, I don't even think we'll have to do that um, because I've had phone calls after phone call about when we're going to be ready. Um, so it's, it's kind of exciting to see that, that gathering up. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you've ever peddled vegetables before, it's not, it's not fun, especially when you do it all day long. Um, but for those kids, if they've gathered that much traction, that's probably what we'll do. Um, the original plan, and we had scheduled, I didn't realize this at the time, but if you want to go to Arcadia Farmer's Market, you have to sign up for it six months in advance. Um, so it's, it, I did not realize that at the time. And we missed out on Edmonds uh, Farmer's Market. That's another six month in advance sign up. Um, and then uh, the other thing too is they only allow so many of one produce to be at the farmer's market. So if you've got somebody selling watermelons, they sign up first, but then you've got other, another guy selling watermelons, they only hire one guy. Um, so it's, it's a learning curve for me, but there's a lot of little towns like Chandler, Wellston, Shawnee is an open market, um, Meeker has one too, and then there's those little ones around us that that's going to be kind of what we focus on. Um, for the kids. Now, some of the kids that signed up for the program that didn't get at the school farm, they have their own land. And we were able to open up ground and lay plastic and get all that stuff taken care of at their own property. Um, now, in that instance, they paid me for the plastic in line um, up front because that's their project now. But it kind of set the bar. It started roll getting that ball rolling for vegetable production outside of um, the school farm itself. Chandler is a lot of livestock-based entrepreneurship, um, almost 60% of its livestock-based entrepreneurship, and um, there's not a lot of production ag uh, with plant-based projects in Chandler. There's, not a, there's no grain, there's no, there's no row crop farming, there's none of that. Um, and this opens up a big opportunity for kids um, not only for Chandler, but for everywhere, because for, and you don't even have to do it the way I did it, but for two grand, instead of buying an animal, and I'm not saying you have to spend that much, but for two grand, instead of buying an animal, you can buy something that pays you back for the next four or five months of the summer, if you put the right work into it. And uh, adding it up right now, the price of a watermelon wholesale is... Uh, nine to ten dollars, eight, nine, ten dollars. I can sell these same watermelons um, for 15 bucks. So, on a half acre of watermelons, is what that is. Um, you can, if you did it right and put it all, you got all your, all your ducks in a row, you can, you're looking at a 10 grand profit off of a half acre of watermelons. So, it's, it's a very lucrative business if you can get into it and, and get the ball rolling. Once you got, once your crops are ready, where do you process or get it ready to take it to the farmer's market? So we've set up a system inside my show barn. Uh, summertime for us is low end on show animals. So my barns usually sit very empty. Um, and I've got an old school method of, of washing vegetables and packing vegetables and, and shipping them. Um, we have large, a large commercial refrigerator at our school. And once all those vegetables are cleaned, we take them to the school and store them. Um, most of the time, if, you're, if you have that set up, uh, I can store vegetables for up to five to seven days, depending on them, if I keep them cool and dry. Um, but we haven't really gotten to that point yet because we're a little bit behind because of all the rain. Um, but that's coming in probably another week or two as we will be gearing up for picking every day. And how do you transport them to the farmer's market kids? Take it to the vehicle? Uh, either or. I told the kids, if you have a specific farmer's market that you'd like to go to, or you know somebody that's going to buy them or anything, you take your produce that way, you bring me my 10%, and everything's good. You, they don't. They, they, that's, that's part of that contract deal. Um, but as of right now, everybody's kind of on board with, we're all going to the farmer's market together. Um, 
and that's kind of what I wanted. Um, I want representation um, because it's easier to label as Chandler FFA instead of Joe. Um, because we've, I've created a, a brand recognition with Chandler FFA for the last couple of years. So people know me. People know what the chapter is. They know what the kids are about. They know why we're doing it. Um, if Johnny goes over there and sells his squash, it's a little different. So I wanted to get those kids uh, the opportunity to gear up to create their own brand under me, the chapter. Dealing with pests to speak of much? Uh, yes, and, and that's all part of that, that material cost is, is pesticides and herbicides. Um, What's some, I know I don't mean to get too awful specific because I know people but like squash bugs is like the bane of my existence mm -hmm. in our school garden and everything. I try every year to get something going. And what has worked for you to limit that? I know it's, I mean, I know some of it's preventative too and trying to catch them while mm -hmm. like the, the early stage or whatever, you know. But. The thing with squash bugs is they don't attack your plants in the very beginning. They attack your plants when they're putting on fruit. Um, and by the time they start putting on fruit, their leaves are this giant and spraying the leaves doesn't do any good to kill the squash bugs underneath. Um, and what we've put together is an aerosol sprayer, um, which is literally a sprayer nozzle. It's, you can find them on Amazon. They're called mosquito. They're for mosquito spray is what they are. And, and it's a clip. It's a clip that goes on the end of your blower. You have the pumper in your hand. You pressurize the pumper, you spray the pump, and then it starts blowing it. And you blow it up underneath the plants and it kills all the bugs that are underneath the plants. Um, and what I've used in the past, and this year I've used it too, is uh, triple action. I've used triple action a lot, or anything with uh, pyrethrin. Yeah, that's what I thought was the active ingredient. I was wondering to see if that's what you do. Yeah, triple action, it may not for me, I've, I've dealt with aphids so bad in my greenhouse to where I can't, triple action is just not cutting it hardly anymore. So I had to go to a harder chemical. Um, but for squash bugs, it'll, it'll kill them on contact almost. And that's really the extent of the in insects that we've had to do, mess with. Um, most of our issue that we've been battling for the th last three years is um, varmints and deer is the hardest part. Uh, my school farm is kind of in a rural area. It's covered by woods. Um, and Highland Dairy, who we lease our property from, has made it very apparent in bold lettering in our contract, you shall not kill any wild animals on the property whatsoever. Um, so those lines kind of make it very difficult to prevent the, the invasion. And what I mean by invasion, last year we had that little acre of that little quarter acre of watermelons was eaten in five to ten days by a pack of raccoons and when i mean pack i mean like when you put the camera on the tree and the ground starts moving because 50 raccoons are rolling through your field at one time that's a pack of raccoons <laughs> um so it, yeah it's it's been a struggle um that's, that's the other expense that I'm looking at right now is uh, putting up netting, putting up electric netting to keep those animals out, which with our size of our area, it's, it's kind of pricey. So that's kind of what we're working through, the struggles we're working through right now. Um, but it, it's a great program. I feel like it's a great program. The last three years have been very rewarding. The kids have gotten a lot out of it. Not a lot of kids do this in my community. Um, and if they do, it's like a little box off their back porch. So nothing like what I've grown up doing my whole life. As far as like breaking ground, um, you might have talked about this before we got here, but um, was it just grass? Or? Yes, all of this was pasture grass. Um, in the past, it's, it's all been where these, where these guys are planting right now, that was cattle lot. Um, and they had turnouts, they had cattle pens on one side and a big electric fence pair, air, paddock area that was all uh, hot wire fence. And so it was very, very thick with Bermuda grass. Um, and oh, 10 years ago, Chandler showed a lot of cattle 
and they all stayed at the school farm. So there was probably 15 head of cattle at the school farm on this little bitty pasture right here. So um, since then, everybody's gone home. Nobody really keeps cattle at the school farm. And this was a nasty overgrown mess right here. And I just burred it off with a brush hog, sprayed it, and then dissed it under. All that stuff, if you decide to do this project or the kids have equipment, tell them no because I don't need some 16 year old kid running a tractor at the school farm and running over somebody because they're not paying attention. Um, I did all the equipment running or I had a parent who brought equipment do all the equipment running um, because it just takes one time running a tractor and nobody paying attention and it all goes south in a hurry. Um, and it was, it's, it's nice because my community is very behind this project. They're very behind what I'm doing. Um, so all I had to make was a few phone calls. We have bought a few pieces of equipment. I've got, a, I've bought the chapter bought a seven foot disc. Um, I've got some harrows. I've got some chisel plows. Um, so that's kind of helped out with, Hey, I've needed a rototiller this week. Well, you're not going to get it for two weeks. That, that type of thing. Um, but I just reached out to my community and they pretty much gave me whatever I wanted when it came to this kind of stuff. The place I got all these, the equipment to do like the plastic roller and all the other equipment was Berry Hill irrigation out of, uh, they're out of Georgia. Um, they do programs with the school all the time and they were pretty eager to help me get all this stuff to me and they cut me a pretty good discount on it as well because um, I'm a school and what I was doing and all that good stuff so that's who I've gone through and that's who I will go through to get this type of irrigation equipment and and specialty equipment that plastic layer is a specialty equipment um, there's no going on Facebook or Craigslist and trying to find one and if you do find one they are messed up big time so it's, it's kind of a niche deal that you have to try to find if that's what you want to do. Now, who did you use to buy this? Berry Hill Irrigation okay. out of Georgia. I mean, the area, this is maybe a dumb obvious question. Do you just mow in between the areas where the plastic is? No, actually, or? so uh, I've got a little, we've got a little two foot rototiller that we've used in the past. And then what I'm trying to do is with the, the multi-culture growing with the grass seed, the summer grass seed, I'm trying to get it to where we can mow in between there. Um, that's what I'm trying to get to. So I'm not having to do so much labor because even with the kids going out there, it's still a battle with weeds. And, um, this is the first dry week. Last week was the first dry week we've had in a long time. So, we're kind of behind the eight ball on getting things cleaned up. Plastic covering help with not absorbing so much of the water, rainwater coming down. Did you think it helped? Oh yes, there there actually is a. It's called a. It's that woven plastic, mm -hmm. um, but it is super expensive, and it's super heavy. Um, this plastic is lighter weight and. You don't, the, the roll plastic, that heavy, that heavy, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but it's, once you use it, once you lay it down, there's not a lot of picking it back up and putting it out again. Um, and this plastic right here, I can roll it up and throw it away. Um, but you don't want, you don't want the rain to go through. You want to prevent rainwater going into your bed. Um, and the reason I say that is because it causes a lot of standing water and when the plastic lays over the top of your beds with that extra rainwater in there it doesn't dry so if you have something like uh well our our peppers right now that are planted right now they're over watered and they're not growing because of the amount of water that's in the wa in the soil right now yeah. um and that's kind of where that goes into play so this is a different kind of plastic. This isn't like plastic culture garden? No, this is plastic culture. Okay, but it's a different kind of plastic. Is that what you're saying? 
I'm sorry. Well, we have a lot of plastic culture around us, but I don't know that much about it. Yes, this is plastic culture. Okay. What we have done here in Chandler is plastic culture. Okay. Um, now, with the plastic that you're talking about, those are long-term plants. So anything like uh, berry production, um, okay. long-term, like two-year plants or three-year or four-year plants, okay. you put the heavy plastic down so that you're not having to worry about because this stuff once it's past that first season like if we were to leave this in the ground it would it would fall apart okay. it's not biodegradable but with sun heat and exposure plastic gets brittle and it starts crumbling okay. and that's what that's what that is okay. and all of that is considered under the realm of plastic culture but this is seasonal plastic culture okay yeah Any other questions? Well, I don't know. You've created some offshoots that you can that you're going to take this. I think. Yes. Like since you can't find that equipment, have mechanics project. Yes. I mean, there's some things that you're going to be able to do. There's a lot of offshoots to this. Yes. There's a lot of offshoots to this, and with um, with the the role that I'm taking in pushing kids into that vegetable production at their houses, mm -hmm. they can start to build their own businesses because there are people in our community that are old school growers that grow in the same way and that have asked us about this because we're right off 66 so everybody drives right by our school farm and I it's it's all the time what do you got going on over there what's what's all that black in the in the in the field and I have to explain it to them and they're like oh my gosh that's cool and a couple of people have asked yeah that's what they really want to know. Uh, a lot of people have asked if, if we could come lay plastic for them. And, and that's kind of a different business than what I was intending for this to be. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting how many different realms this is going. Uh, I've had some interest with growing microgreens. I have a couple of kids have asked about doing microgreens. And I think that's the, the battle we're going to tackle when we get back to school. Um, with the other grant that was coming up in July um, is over microgreens. So it's different different stuff, but a lot of interest. Food processing. Oh, like so much. Vegetables. Yeah, okay. and, and there was one of them that talked about that as well, is he has the cucumbers. Yeah. And we planted four rows of cucumbers. He wanted to get really aggressive with it, so he planted four row, 400 foot rows of cucumbers uh, over a thousand plants of cucumbers um, and I told him once he was like oh I was like okay well maybe they won't all germinate I mean that's that's usually the, the risk you run is maybe they won't all germinate well they did so we've got a lot of cucumbers coming and I told him you could take this into a food processing and there's no extra licenses to can your own vegetables and sell them um, you don't have to have a food preparation. You don't have to have any of that to get into that business. Now, there are some like, you have to have like a standard kitchen and, and the, but you don't have to follow, it's, it's different. And it's been a little while since I've looked it up. She knows all about it. She had one of them too. Um, <laughs> and we've talked about this before, but he was going into that whole realm as well is, is start pickling because I told him, I said, you're not gonna, you're not gonna sell all these you got to figure out what you're going to do with them or it's going to be a waste. There's and a, so There's an FFA chapter that I follow on Facebook called uh, Franklin County High School. Mm -hmm. And they have, uh, their ag department opens up during the summer a, a canning facility, whether you can, you can use jars uh, or cans, and people can actually bring in their produce. Uh, they actually, I think, also do chicken, um, some kind of meats maybe. But anyways, they can those items for people and charge them uh, to, to can those, mm -hmm. those goods. So there's another avenue that uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's be really neat. So you may have mentioned this. I was choking off a pear, apparently. Um, <laughs> but why, or have you thought about just opening up, instead of taking your stuff to like the farmer's markets, having a farmer's market at your facility? Because if you have a kid with pickles and yes. kids bring stuff at home. Say, if you could get your school to cover the liability insurance, 
Mm -hmm. That's a you pick, and they can do the labor. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I was, I was just well that, or I was just thinking, just have your kids pick the stuff instead of hauling it other places. Have people come to you and buy it directly. You know. Yes. Saturday, and and that's kind of the that the the yeah. thought mill the thought mill that's going on with this. And like I said, this is this is the first year right. that this pro I put this program in effect. Um, so it's kind of a learning experience for me right now. And the best thing I could come up with that would keep us away from bringing people out to the school farm and me sitting at the school farm for 12 hours selling vegetables is let's go to farmer's markets once a week. And what we sell is what we sell. What we don't, when we don't, we'll sell it. We'll get rid of it at home or we'll store it. So, and that's kind of where I was trying to, the, the meet that first need in the beginning. Well, and I don't know where your ag building sits within your community or whatever, if you're in closer to town or not, but um, my old ag program started a farmer's market and she kind of got herself into a pickle where she would be going to like Porter to get uh, peaches, mm -hmm. getting corn, you know, different things. And so you spent half the week prepping for the farmer's market on Saturday. Yeah. So I, I could see the monster that turns into, but if yeah. you have all your produce there. You and that's that's kind of what I modeled this off of yeah. um, was was her deal. Yeah. Um, but I took me out of it and put right. the kids in it. Well, that, that's, that and great. it made it a lot easier. And truthfully, at, at the beginning, um, with the watermelon stuff, when we first started two years ago, it was I was doing a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why I was doing all the work is because I enjoyed it. It was fun to me. I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot going on over the summertime, so I just went right into it. That, that's exactly right. It was 2020, and there was nothing to do, and I said, let's grow some watermelons, and I had every, week, every evening I was out there working them. So here's my question. Like, have you tried to establish any sort of farm-to-fork relationships with like, restaurants in Chandler? No, no, and, and that's, that's where this is going to end up going is – I just didn't want to promise something that I could not deliver because this is our first year to ever do anything like this. Um, never done the plastic book culture before. Never done it. Um, huge learning curve for me. Um, never had this much in a long time just by myself, like managing it all by myself um, with the kids. So I didn't want to promise something that I couldn't deliver on because a lot of those guys that are in my community are small town, small town stores. So if I say, hey, I'm going to provide all your produce this summer, you better, come up with it. you better come up with it because they're not ordering it. Would you provide it to your school cafeteria? And that's, that's the other avenue too. Given that you've done student contracts with parents in general, haven't had much of any issues as far as no. them doing the work? Showing no, up, and, and I, I thought I would. Um, but it's a money motivation. Those kids, I, I can, over the past two years, I've always asked kids to come help me mow the school farm, and I've made those kids that keep animals at the school farm to come help me mow the school farm. Um, but half the time, that labor is not worth it because they're, half, they're halfway doing it. Um, but with this, it's such a money-motivated system that it, uh, they, they haven't had a problem with it. What would you do differently? What would I do differently? Yeah, so like this um, right start now. a lot earlier. Okay. Yeah, start the planting, the planting process a lot earlier. Um, also, because I'd, I'd like to say start advertising a lot earlier, telling people what's going on and telling people what's coming, but I just don't want to do that. I'm just so scared to do that if I don't have the produce to sell them. Um, you said earlier, you start them in the greenhouse? You're yes. And transplant Not all of them, though. Not all of them. Yeah. yeah. Which ones have transplanted well for you versus the ones that maybe not so much? All right, so this year, it's hard to say because my greenhouse is so old, and I don't know if it was us the problem or the greenhouse the problem, um, but I started tomatoes and peppers in the greenhouse. Um, everything else was from seed because... My, if you've ever came to Chandler, see my greenhouse, it's a 20 by 30. It's tiny. And when you pack 2,000 plants in there for a spring plant sale, plus all of those vegetables, it's hard to move around. 
Um, so I started only tomatoes and peppers from seed. They grew really well in the greenhouse, but as soon as we transplanted them, they just shot. Uh, so I started everything back from seed and it had a lot more success with it. That's the reason I ask is I've, I've seen stuff that I direct so after a three week start, mm -hmm. outgrow and pass. Yep. Uh, and I just was like, man, I guess I just, I didn't know if you were doing something different with transplants that was working well. Yep. And those kids that uh, chose the seeds that we grew in the greenhouse, um, they actually earned an earlier profit than those who chose to plant direct seed in because I told them um, these profits will go to you because they're your garden plants. So if we sold watermelon, tomatoes, or peppers, those kids were in charge of selling them, not me. Um, and I put them strictly in their hands. So That's those right kids, yeah. yeah. And they kind of started that ball rolling a lot earlier. Could you high tunnel tomatoes and peppers to get an earlier crop? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And I tried that. Uh, the NRCS does a grant program with high tunnels. Um, they do not do it for schools, though, because uh, I called about it. Um, but, yes, a lot of the people that are in our community that do grow vegetable production, like our commercial vegetable producers, they are all high tunnel. Um, almost everything's high tunnel. But your kids that have their stuff at home could possibly... Yes, they those. can. High tunnels are greenhouses that don't have ventilation or heating or anything. Um, their greenhouse that is totally sealed up in the summertime, in the wintertime, and then they have roll-up sides in the summertime. Um, the difference between high tunnel and greenhouse, high tunnel is not ventilated mechanically, Greenhouses are ventilated mechanically. They're more of a controlled environment compared to a, in a non-controlled environment. And, and it's in the ground, like you're planting directly. Planting you're planting directly in the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I just I saw Tim had a deal of his saw a video of his chicken run around his garden. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, a small high tunnel for a tomato operation, mm -hmm. kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah, and Framing. and that is that is the extra. Yeah, that's the extra. And with kids earning their own money and starting these projects again in the in the next year, that's something that I'm going to sit down with them and talk to them about: is what can we do differently? How can we change the project? And what do we need to get that's going to make this better? And that that's kind of where we're going with it. There's after science fair stuff that you can do there. Yeah. Oh, so much, oh, yeah. so much. Extending the growing season. And that's what we're doing right now is a lot of these kids that are part of this program that are growing vegetables, they don't realize it yet, but they're actually growing their own agri-science fair projects as well. As long as they collect that data. Cool. Any other questions? I think that's a, you've done a great job. Yeah, this is very, very great job. Yeah, it, it, uh, it was, it's kind of a labor of love. It's kind of labor of love. Um, but this is, this is what I've done for my whole life almost. So uh, it's, it's getting those kids involved. It's getting those kids to find something else. And it's not pushing livestock, which I do not want to do that anymore. So did, did your, I don't know it's probably a little different since it's your school farm, but did the school say anything about water, like keeping track of how much water you use? I just keep a monthly track of it. Um, like there, there is a way for you to keep track of it? Yeah, you just, you just keep a monthly track. The only thing that we're using water for out there is, is these gardens. So whatever water that we have used in May, June, and July, and August well, is what we've used from the garden itself. Okay, so you just use like the... The meter, water, water yeah, meter. the meter, yeah, the water meter. But, I mean, the... the is that something they asked you to keep track of, or is it just you're just being... You just want to collect data on that. I'm collecting it um, because as of right now, water use has been a minimal. Um, the only thing really water-wise, we had to water pretty heavy. Uh, the middle to end of April was very dry and hot, and we had to water pretty heavily. So we were watering uh, to get on this system, to get the inch of rain that's required per plant per week, you have to water 12 hours. 
um, because of the intermittent drip. Um, so you can either, what I did is I broke it up two times a week. I would water for six hours and I got my one inch of rain. Um, and that was the biggest thing that I had to research when it came to uh, figuring how much water to put down was that, that number. And in the ground watering goes faster than above ground watering. So if you're using sprinkler systems, it's double the time to get a one inch rainfall than it is for underground watering. So you're using less water with less time. With, with your students, what are the roles and tasks, like I maybe chart that out. I, I was curious how much you have for them to do and then are they able to know when it's time to fertilize or? Yes. And all that? Like, mm -hmm. I just didn't know how far they're able to go and how much you've had to teach them. Um, it, it's kind, kind of been, it. yeah, it's kind of been a learning process. Um, a lot of these kids uh, have no clue. Um, so I had to kind of start from scratch. Uh, so yeah, we had to, I pretty much set a summer schedule. Um, you can go out there and work whenever you want in the evenings or mornings, um, but watering has to be done. I, my summer schedule for watering when we need it, and they're waiting on me to text them when it's time to start watering. Um, but when we need it, it's Mondays and Wednesdays, and then we fertilize on Wednesdays, or Wednesdays is when we fertilize. And that's their schedule. Um, and then when we got, before we, left class, before we left school, I showed them mixing fertilizers and the safe protocols to mixing fertilizers and all that stuff is in my shop right now at the school farm is, is how to mix and scale it out and, and how much to weigh. And uh, using the, uh, the medicator, to inject medicine, inject fertilizer, they all, yeah, so it was, it was a process, but. So do you do both granular fertilizer as well? As, no. Uh, it's all just water-soluble? It's all water-soluble fertilizer. Uh, granular fertilizer uh, releases slower, and it has to require overhead rain to release. Most granular fertilizers have to require overhead rain to release if you don't till it into the soil. So you can spread granular fertilizer on top, but until it rains, it's not doing any good. Um, and then the other thing too, is if you spread granular fertilizer, you're growing weeds as well. I want all my fertilizer to be injected into those plants right at the root system when it, ha when it happens. And the kids, it took, it took some time to get these kids on board. Um, because just like anything else we try to teach in class, it's, how much knowledge do they have to know to get to the point where they can take care of it on their own? And I didn't realize at first how long that was going to take. Um, because in the past, I've been in charge of, okay, Monday, you guys be out here, we're going to fertilize. And I'm mixing fertilizer. And I'm setting up the, the medicator. And I'm doing all this. And I was like, you know what? I'd like to enjoy my summer a little bit. And if these kids are willing to put into this project and, and create an SAE, they need to be doing all the work. And training them to get there was an uphill battle sometimes, um, just because all these kids that signed up were eighth and ninth graders, really. And that's, that's what I'm hoping for, is this just, the snowball goes downhill and the let, I, have, I don't have to put in a whole lot to get them all on board. Are kids allowed a certain number of rows, or how does that work? So in the beginning, I divided it. I divided that this field. Let's go back. This field to the east, this one, it runs east and west. And there's about 55 rows of vegetables, potential rows here in this field. And I just divided that up between however many vegetables they were doing um, and how many groups I had. And it ended up being a free-for-all, really. I mean, you can do as many as you want or as low amount as you want. Um, like the kid that got corn, one of my kids that got corn, he, planted, he was able to plant like 18 rows of corn. So he's got almost this whole back section of corn in the ground. Now he only planted, uh, what did he plant, 12 or 15 rows, and then he took on because no one picked pumpkins, 
and he took on pumpkins is going to plant pumpkins on the back half of it. Um, so it's really, I didn't have a whole lot of input into it, uh, number wise of students. So I was really able to just open it up to them all. So that, that's how you limited as far as so you didn't have multiple kids having cucumbers, so to say. Yeah, no, you pick one. Okay. And once cucumbers are picked, they're picked. Okay. Yeah, there's no Johnny's growing cucumbers and Billy's growing cucumbers. No, it's, it's you pick it, it's off the list. And so essentially if that, that kid's family, I mean the kid that's growing cucumbers and that family wants some tomatoes or whatever, then they can essentially maybe trade yeah. the kid mm -hmm. raising tomatoes. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's what I wanted to do is I kind of wanted to create a, a barter system, a free trade system, because I, I, I want to provide to my community first, firsthand. That's what all this is for. It's to provide to my community. Um, give those kids the economic opportunity to provide for their community. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and let all this go to waste either. So that, that's kind of where that ended up. You, be you better apply for that innovative idea. So <laughs> you better do it. I'll be disappointed if you don't. So kids are in pairs. And so me and my partner, we pick one vegetable and that's all we can get. Mm -hmm. But then how many rows of that vegetable I want to pick is a free for all? Yeah. Depends on how many. It's how much you can keep up with. Well, that's true. Yeah. Your and. Cucumbers double in size in 12 hours, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. If, if two people pick cucumbers, how do you pick who gets cucumbers? It's first come, first serve. So like group A, they're, they're, they draw numbers. What they did is they drew numbers. And group A through D, and A picks one, they get to pick first. B picks four, they get to pick last. And that's how that went. Yeah, because I had a lot of that too. A lot of, well, I want to grow this, or I want to grow that. And especially after I told them how much they could make off that watermelon field, everybody wanted to grow watermelons. So, so I guess, and we can talk later, I guess, but... As far as like water infrastructure, did you have to run new water lines or was all that? No, uh, I've got a, my pig barn is here and I've got a hydrant off the back. Okay. The other thing too that's very, very important with this is you cannot have a hydrant that's less than 12 PSI. If you have a hydrant that's less than 12 PSI, they can't run all the, all the, all the drip system. And this hydrant has a 10 PSI. And that's the main kicker is because the water main comes off the highway to here, so this one has like an 18 PSI, so it's able to almost water this entire field. But when they built my school farm, they ran all this to a one inch line, and the one inch line comes off the back and it kills the pressure. So on that system, I have to water intermittently. So I have 13 rows on this one right here. I can only water half that field at a time. But I have so much water pressure down here I can water both fields in the same day, at the same time. Another thought, and, and uh, like you were talking about your kids wanting to be, oh, you know, want to do watermelons. Well, if watermelons is a good money maker, maybe everybody gets maybe a row of watermelons or split the profits. Split the, the bride. Yeah. Everybody else gets, oh, you get cucumbers. What I, what I did is I took 